Commerce. And it's my very great pleasure this morning to welcome the Mayor of Calgary, Nahid Nenshi, and indeed all of you here this morning to Mars. At Mars we see an important part of our mission of driving economic and social prosperity in Canada and around the world as essentially a city building mission in that we are building the future of our urban economies through innovation. We're glad therefore that the Mayor took time out of his busy schedule to join us here at Mars and we look forward to hearing his thoughts on how cities can work together to create a better Canada and how innovation is an important part of that work. By way of introduction, Mayor Nahid Nenshi is a passionate Calgarian, an accomplished business professional, an active community leader. During his first term in office, Mayor Nenshi's leadership has already resulted in many positive changes in Calgary to build better communities, keep Calgarians moving, and transform government in a very citizen-focused way. Mayor Nenshi grew up in Calgary, but has lived and worked in cities around the world before he returned home. He holds a Bachelor of Commerce degree with distinction from the University of Calgary, and a Master of Public Policy from the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard, where he studied as a Kennedy Fellow. Mayor Nenshi was sworn, sworn in as Calgary's 36th Mayor on October 25th, 2010. So the format this morning is we're going to have a facilitated Q&A with the Mayor, which my colleague Earl Miller will moderate, and then we'll leave plenty of time for your questions. We want to make this um, a truly interactive discussion this morning. So before I hand over to, to Earl, um, please join me in giving a very warm, warm welcome to our guest this morning, the Mayor of Calgary, Nahid Nenshi. Thank you so much, Ewan, and good morning, everybody. Well, I think we're all pretty excited uh, to have Mayor Nenshi here. And so without uh, any delay, I'm going to start with a question about the fact that you've set out a, a plan in, in Calgary, a 30-year plan for investment in infrastructure and transit. Mm -hmm. And it's at the same time you're spreading the small stuff. Uh, you're focusing on cutting red tape so that parents can find it easier to register for community programs like swimming classes. Mm -hmm. So as a mayor, how do you balance the long-term priorities with short-term priorities? And what's in the middle of that approach? Well, thanks uh, for asking that. Uh, it's an important part of city government, I think. Well, let me just say, first of all, thank you for having me uh, here. It's great uh, to see Mars from the inside. I was uh, I was one of those vague attendants who was present at the birth of this organization and uh, uh, when I lived in Toronto. And it is terrific to see uh, how well you're doing. So thank you for being here. I'm excited that I've got my own hashtag. That's weird. <laughs> but to your question. It's important to answer that question, I think, in the context of what municipal government does and why municipal government is important. And I should say, as I'm speaking of municipal government, that on the way in, I saw a Toronto City Councilor, who would have been my city councilor if I still lived here, Christian Long Time. Where are you? There you are. So, Christian will agree with me on this that municipal government is an interesting thing. You know, the, the swiftest way to irritate me is to refer to the senior levels of government. Mm -hmm. Because in fact, I believe that your municipal government is your senior government. Because your municipal government is the government that does stuff that matters to you every single day. I was in Ottawa yesterday and I used one of my favorite lines and then I realized I probably shouldn't use that line in Ottawa. Which is, um, I can actually never really remember what it is that the federal government does. <laughs> Defense, immigration, international stuff. <laughs> That's all. Um, but they have all the money. Transfer right? um, uh, payments. I guess they, they give back money that we gave them <laughs> occasionally. Um, and sometimes I joke that, you know, if the federal government were to disappear while we were sitting in this beautiful room, um, it would probably be a week or two before anyone knows. If the provincial government were to do now I shouldn't say that in the street because you're funding the government, the government would the room would disappear. But um, if the provincial government were to disappear, um, you know, you notice quick if you were in school or in hospital, um, but it might take a couple of hours before the impact was felt. 
if your municipal government disappeared while we were in this room, well, you have no police, you have no fire, you have no roads, you have no transit, you have no clean water. In my city, you have no electricity. And certainly you had none of the things that make life worth living. No arts, no culture, no parks, no recreation, no sport facilities. And you notice pretty quickly, because you'd be dead. And so when you talk about sweating the small stuff, that small stuff really matters. How often do we think about the fact that you can drink tap water? One billion people in the world don't have that. Uh, and that's what your municipal government provides every single day, every single minute of every single day. And that is an incredibly important thing to remember, that to keep the wheels turning, to grease the system, is actually the stuff that people need to live healthy and safe and happy lives every single day. But at the same time, you've got to be able to think big about where are we going. And your example is a good one with the... Uh, the 30-year plan for Calgary Transit. I was surprised when I was first elected to learn that because transit funding is so episodic and so ad hoc, that we actually didn't have any plan for transit in the long term. We would, when funding suddenly became available, kind of look at the shelf and go, oh, no, let's build that one because that matches the amount of funding that we've got. So as in any organization, as in, uh, as in any complex organization, and it is a $3 billion a year, 20,000 employee organization, you've got to be able to move back and forth. You've got to be able to purpose, if you like, between the details and the vision stuff um, every single day. But all of that is focused on one thing, which is serving the citizen and ensuring that, as I say to my 20,000 colleagues in the city of Calgary, we have to ask ourselves every single day, many, maybe multiple times every day. How is what I am doing right now making it better for somebody to live here? How is what I am doing right now making life better for my neighbors? And if we can't answer that question, if we can't have that in mind, then we have to ask ourselves why we're doing what we're doing. And that's the impetus behind the cut red tape projects that you mentioned, right? It's not a left wing or a right thing, right wing thing, to make sure people aren't wasting time in lines, uh, or to make sure that they are served, being able to be served by their municipal government as efficiently and as effectively as possible. The cover and take program is kind of a neat example. We didn't have any money. Um, we put up, uh, literally, I'm not even speaking in analogies here, we literally put up posters around the water coolers um, through the city for phase one, which was employee engagement, going out to my colleagues and saying, how would you cover and take? How can you serve citizens better? For two weeks, we put a little note on our intranet and we put these posters um, around the water coolers and just said, share your ideas. And I thought that we would get three or four really good ideas for cutting red tape. I would go ahead and implement them and make those employees heroes. Right? Talk about how great they were, use that to model behavior throughout the organization. You got hundreds of them. Hundreds, hundreds. And my issue changed to how in the world do I implement all of these? Um, so, so far, with a zero investment, we saved citizens about a million bucks in wasted time uh, and wasted money and just by moving things online, by giving, empowering people to actually answer questions, by reminding my colleagues that we exist to serve the citizen or the small business, not the bureaucracy in the process. And sometimes that, and we're not there yet, we're nowhere near there, but we're starting. Sometimes people think that cities are only about fixing potholes and making sure that I can get into a recreation program or ensuring that um, my elder parent can be in um, residential care. Um, the vision thing, in an innovation sometimes I think people believe as, a, as, as one of those visionary kind of concepts, isn't something that people grasp particularly. So you have said um, in, in a report that you wrote to 2002 yeah, well, that, 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 that discovery from innovation was one of the most important things that a city could do in order to be strong. So what did you mean by that and what role do you think civic leaders have in being able to create a climate for innovation? It's really about it's about inputs and outputs and outcomes. We are in the pothole filling business and we have to be. The single biggest issue in Calgary at the moment, there are two issues that are far more important to citizens than anything else at the moment. And I'll tell you what those two things are. Dandelions and mosquitoes. <laughs> We've had an unbelievably wet spring. The city looks, you saw the video, right? I love that video. Everyone is young, everyone is gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> Very Calgary. 
Um, it really is, it really is. You saw how beautiful the city looked. And I'm embarrassed to tell you that if you came to the city today, you would find a very soggy, very lush city that needs a good mow. Um, everywhere. And, um, and these things matter because they're important aspects of people's quality of life. By the way, it's interesting that you talked about elderly people in residential care, which is not at all a city responsibility, and it shouldn't be. It is a provincial responsibility. But we, those of us who run the community, and this is actually really key to your question, understand that those issues impact us in the city. So if there is no affordable housing for seniors, it's the city that deals with the social disorder and the problems that fall over. So every city across this country invests in affordable housing for seniors. It's not our responsibility in any way. But we actually have to be able to have a community that works for everybody. And that's the key point. The pothole fixing can be thought of in two different ways. It can be thought of as the ticket to the game. You've got to have roads free of potholes in order to do the other things you need. Or you can think of it as the output, which is once you've created a city that works, a tax base and a system that works, you have the ability and the capacity to fix the potholes. The potholes are part of the equation either way. But the key thing is to think about why it is that people live in cities. And I would argue that people live in cities because of access. Access to educational opportunities, access to jobs, access to ideas, access to different people, access to all the things that we need in order to fulfill the daily needs of our lives every single day. And for that to work, we need cities to be economic engines. And for cities to be economic engines, then we need people with different ideas to clash with those ideas every day and create better things. And that's what I was writing about in 2002. That's what I still believe, that, that cities are innovation engines. The numbers bear this out. For example, taxpayers in the city of Calgary send to their municipal government about $1.5 billion a year property tax. Property tax is the only form of revenue that we have the ability to control. It's about half of our operating budget, which is $3 billion. The other half is things like utility fees, user fees for those swim classes, transit fares, and so on. Meanwhile, so that's $3 billion, 1.6 from taxes. Meanwhile, Calgary taxpayers said to the province of Alberta $4 billion a year more than we receive every year in government services from the province. To the federal government, we said $10 billion a year more. My operating budget is only $3 billion. And now, I'm not saying that we begrudge that. We understand that people in Wayne, Alberta cannot afford a hospital. We understand that people in Rockyford, Alberta can't afford a water treatment plant. We think part of being in a community is we've got to fund that stuff. We even believe that we have to fund whatever it is that the federal government does. <coughs> Somebody has to do it. And, um, but what I'm suggesting is that the reason that tax base is in the cities, the reason people want to be in the cities is A, the cities are good places to live and there's no problems. And transit systems work. And we invest in things that make life like living like arts and culture and sport and recreation. But also because those cities are the critical mass for innovation and driving the economy. See, I told you I'd get to the answer to your question eventually. Um, three years of this and I still don't know how to speak in sound bites. <laughs> Um, well, you're, you're, you've been a bit irreverent about the, the federal and provincial government, and I think that's what that is. <laughs> um, but anyway, so to maintain that tax base, you've got to have people who want to work together. You know, the example that I always use is, and this always shocks people in Toronto, I'm about to shock all of you Toronto in the room. The Alberta oil sands are nowhere near downtown Calgary. <laughs> <laughs> The Calgary Tower. Oh, we don't have a picture of the Calgary Tower in any of these banners. It's up there on the slide. The Calgary Tower is not, in fact, a giant oil derrick. <laughs> By the way, I said that yesterday. My chief of staff was like, "You know, we know the guy who owns the Calgary Tower. And he's really rich. Are you sure it's not an oil derrick? And he's just not siphoning off. <laughs> no, I'm pretty certain um, that it is not, in fact, an oil derrick. The oil sands are a two and a half hour flight." From they're about a two and a half hour flight. They're about a four hour flight from Toronto and a slightly longer flight from Houston. It's a big country. So the question we have to ask ourselves is why are those head offices in those buildings in downtown Calgary? Why are those great jobs in those buildings in downtown Calgary? Why aren't those jobs in Shanghai or Dubai or Houston or God forbid Toronto? <laughs> and the reason is twofold. One, 
people want to live in Calgary. It's a great place to live, uh, and people want to be there. And two, because other people are there, they want to be there because business thrives on innovation when they are clusters, and Mars knows that. Uh, we know that very well um, in this city as well as in my own. You know, Calgary created, four, did you know that Calgary created 14% of all new jobs in Canada last year? A city with less than 5% of the population. I mean, that's why I'm here in Ontario to remind Canadians that there are great career opportunities in Canada. <laughs> you don't have to leave. You want to work in the top tiers of finance, for example. So getting back to clusters, right? You want to work in the top tier of finance. Well, don't go to Wall Street. Don't go be a peg in the machine. If you want to work in the top tiers of finance, come to an emerging global finance center like Calgary. You know, uh, Canada accounts for three to five percent of all oil and gas production in the world, but we account for about fifteen percent of all deal flow in the energy industry. The mergers, acquisitions, and financings all go through Canada, and most of that goes through downtown Calgary. So every investment bank in the world as a presence in Calgary. And because they have people who are doing financing for energy, those people are bankers. They're always looking for deals. So they're looking at financing in other areas. We've got 5,300 tech startups in Calgary, the largest number of tech startups per capita in the country. And so those clusters grow on one another organically. I mean, I'm not saying anything Mars doesn't know. This is what Mars is built on. No, I think it, but we have to continue to do it. You've established that you know, it's not a false dichotomy. I mean, you, you need to sweat the small stuff in cities because those are important to people's daily lives. If you don't fill the potholes, if you don't have a transit system that you works, can't have the foundation no one will move them. there. Exactly. And no one will want to live there. And if no one lives there, you don't have the innovation. Right. And so, so much of it is about increasing the flow of talent. So much of it that it is attracting great people who live in cities. But you did touch on the subject of natural resources. And frankly, when you're talking to someone from Calgary, you can't escape the issue. But we need to look more broadly. And we know that as Canadians, we have been highly dependent on natural resources and resource-based industries for our prosperity. And that's likely to continue in the future. But let's look at cities, and let, let's look at the potential that cities have for diversifying the economy and creating a more sustainable path. What are your thoughts on that subject? Well, I'll answer the question that you were slightly too polite to ask. Um, um, <laughs> which is really about the importance of the energy industry to our uh, to our economy, and it is important. Um, we survived 2008. Let's be blunt. We survived 2008 not because of great banking regulation. We survived 2008 because of the Canadian energy sector. Canada made it through the global recession better than just about anywhere. And Calgary made it through that recession better than just about anywhere because of Canadian energy. Let's not put too fine a point on it. Um, in fact, uh, in Calgary, when you talk about diversification, it was interesting because in 2008, the price of oil dropped, I think, 40 or 45 percent. And if that had happened 10 years earlier, not only would Calgary have been in a recession that it, yet, it would have yet to come out of, the entire country would have been. And somehow that didn't happen because we created critical mass because we figured out ways to leverage the knowledge that we have in the energy sector into other sectors. Um, we managed to make our way through. And I think that's a really important thing to understand. But I want to be clear about something, which is, yes, we happen to have a natural resource-based economy. Let's not apologize for that. Let's not be begrudge that. It is the hand we've been dealt. And it's our job as Canadians to figure out how best to play that hand. But you know what? It's a really good hand. It's a really good hand. We've been dealt a royal flush on the first deal. So let's not apologize for that. Let's figure out what we do with that in a thoughtful public policy way to ensure prosperity for all Canadians. And that's really what I'm getting at. I mean, I think there is no one who's going to argue with you that the prosperity that we enjoy, with this, the, the civic life that we enjoy, the terrific education we have access to has a lot to do with the natural endowments of the country. Absolutely. I would be foolish. But well, I think people do well, argue that. People argue that all the time. But we're not here. <laughs> I, think, I think what we're saying is we're at a point where we can consider options, including how 
because we now have, are in a position of prosperity of charting a somewhat different path, which is more sustainable. You've thought about that yourself. You're looking at recycling at the, at the community level, but you're also looking at community energy planning and more strategic ways in which to consolidate cities and make them more energy efficient. Let's look at this from a straight up public policy perspective yeah. and recognize that as a nation, we are sitting on a resource that is incredibly valuable, on many resources, but let's just say a resource that's incredibly valuable. We know that the world will move to a low carbon future. It's not going to happen today. It's probably not going to happen in our kids' lifetimes. It may happen in our grandkids' lifetimes. It certainly will happen in our grandkids' grandkids' lifetimes. So we are sitting on a resource that is incredibly valuable today, but that we know is going to be less valuable in the future. So is it not rational public policy? Is it not rational public policy to monetize the resource that we have today, knowing it will be less valuable in the future? And figure out a way that we can use that resource to create a legacy for those grandkids' grandkids when that resource is less valuable. That means we have to do three things that governments have been willing to do. And all of them are about investment. We have to invest the proceeds of that resource in something that will have value for those grandkids' grandkids. So number one, bricks and mortar infrastructure. You know, while we have the resource, we should be investing in things like transit across this country that will last, um, that people will get benefit from in the future that we might not be able to afford to build in the future. Number two, we gotta save the cash. We actually have to have money socked away in sovereign wealth funds across this country so that when the um, resource is no longer available to us, we can draw on the interest. As simple as that. The Norway Sovereign Wealth Fund, I wish I should have actually looked up this stat, but I read some shocking stat that that Sovereign Wealth Fund controls something like 10% of the equity in the world um, because it's grown so big, and that's, that's the future legacy for the people of Norway. And then the third is we have to use what we've got today in terms of skills <laughs> in monetizing that resource to bridge into new and innovative uh, ways of, of, of building the economy. So in Calgary, for example, there is no reason in the world. We have the best chemical engineers, we've got the best environmental engineers in the world working in the Canadian energy industry. If you're an environmental engineer, there's nowhere you'd rather work than in the oil sands industry because the opportunity is huge to make a big difference. So there is no reason that we should not also be the center of alternative energy in the world because we have people who know energy better than anybody else. So how do we make that bridge? How do we create that kind of innovation, that kind of clustering, that kind of knowledge transfer? Those are questions that we struggle with every day. Do you have some examples of how we might make that transfer? Because essentially what you're saying is, I feel like I should be asking you that. That was more fun. <laughs> uh, we can have a long conversation, but I, 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 I appreciate the point that you made here, which is we need to realize the value of what we have and not depreciate it by talking about it in a negative way, but also look for the opportunity it creates to build new things. What Absolutely. We identify are, what are the new things? Yeah, and them? don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting the governments are doing this correctly. Mm -hmm. We're burning the furniture to heat the house. We can't use what we're getting out of our resource based economy only to, to, to fund current, uh, current operating needs. That's crazy. Yeah. Uh, we've got to figure out ways to actually save in the three ways I talked about as best we can. And of course, there's lots of examples of this. You know, like anywhere um, in Calgary right now, we are absolutely full of startups that are interested in more efficient, um, more efficient processes in oil sands extraction and recovery, uh, in wind power. Right, Canada is one of the world leaders in the area of wind power, for example, and in our own uh, publicly owned utility, Enmax. Uh, is a huge part of that. Um, and certainly, you know, Calgary, downtown Calgary is crawling with people, every one of whom thinks they've got the next big idea uh, in terms of alternative energy, and that's a good thing. Uh, it is, we've got to make sure that we, we got to make sure that we help and support those folks. Yeah, and I think that if we're here at Mars, I think one of the things that's definitely true, when you look at our own clean technology practice, for example, the vast majority of the companies are in the energy business. So we're not apologizing for the fact that as a society, we need to produce energy. We're simply looking at what creative ways to transition from uh, the economy that we have to a balanced economy which allows us to take a more sustainable path. And I think that's something you're interested in too. Now, I wanted to actually shift the discussion a little bit. Okay, I'm going to go on about this all day. 
<laughs> I know we could. But I want to go back to the issue of the fiscal deal. Because you're talking here about building strong cities. Um, strong cities are in part about the kind of economy um, that allows a fair distribution of wealth between where the, the, the engines of wealth exist, and mention that that's cities, and between other levels of government. You've also said that there needs to be a new fiscal deal. So can you say a little bit more about what that deal would look like and how we get there? Let's use transit as an example. That 30-year plan uh, for transit that we've created is going to cost $12.9 billion over the next 30 years. Currently, I have zero dollars, but that's okay, I like a challenge. And those numbers are unimaginably big. And what it means is that for a city like Calgary, we have to start spending about $500 million a year, a half a billion dollars a year, every year for 30 years. Given that my total tax take is 1.5 billion, it's impossible to imagine the city's funding that through the property tax, which by the way is the most regressive unfair form of taxation ever invented. And so we need participation from those other orders of government, who by the way, we're paying all these taxes too. And the criteria for that participation is really simple. It needs to be long-term. It has to live beyond the life of one government. It needs to be predictable, and it needs to be stable. Those are all the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, because I'm not expecting anybody to show up at my door with a check for $12.9 billion. I don't actually know Nigel Wright, so it's not going to work. But I think he's stopped doing that. <laughs> My chief of staff is here if you need any personal checks. Um, <laughs> he says it's worth Let's, let's just keep it there anyway. Everyone in this room just. Uh, uh, yeah. $90. He said that's his limit. Anyway, um, but uh, I'm not expecting that check. But what I'm hoping to do is be able to plan predictably for the long term and say, look, I can borrow against future cash flows because I know those cash flows are going to be there. Um, in order to start building stuff out. We're building, our, our long-term plan only has one new LRT line in it. It's a pretty big LRT line. Uh, in fact, it doubles the amount of LRT that we have currently in the city. Um, another 40 kilometers, that's probably a $5 billion project. Um, and so I need to be able to start. And the only way that I can think of to get long-term, predictable, stable funding is through a revenue sharing agreement uh, on taxes. It can't just be the federal government announcing a new program or the provincial government's announcing a new program saying we're going to give you X billion dollars for infrastructure over time. It has to be something that says, look, over the long term, you get a portion of the gas tax, which the federal government did do in the 2013 budget, the index into inflation. That's huge. It's probably the most significant thing that a federal government has done for cities in more than a decade. So the debate but that we're having is not here, enough. The debate that we're having here now. Important. We're talking about revenue tools. We're talking about dedicated funds, two billion dollars a year for regional transit. All of that's important. The conversation has to begin in order for people to start looking for alternatives. It should have begun ten years ago. Sure. Um, and certainly, the federal government at that time tried to start that conversation, but it got overshadowed by a whole bunch of other things going on. Mm -hmm. um, but I think this federal government is ready for that. You know, um, it's a little early in the morning to be talking actual politics. Mm -hmm. But one of the interesting things about our current federal government is that they spent a long time looking for their majority in Quebec. And they didn't find their majority in Quebec. They found it in Toronto and Vancouver. In fact, the conservative government is an urban government. Um, and their majority is found in the big cities, and particularly the suburbs of the big cities across this country. And I think that penny is starting to drop federal level and they realize that the coalitions on which they base their electoral successor may be different than what they thought they were. So this is exactly the right time to be having this conversation. So for those of us in cities, it's time to recognize that the alignment with cities, uh, the time is right and the advocacies that we have are a greater share uh, of the wealth created in cities um, is a timely discussion to have with the federal government, the federal government. I always say that when you see... But they say they have debt. Well, they do have debt. Look, of course they do. 
Um, they have debt, our provincial governments have debt. Cities don't have deficits, by the way, right? right? Not allowed most, we're not allowed in most places, and, and the city of Calgary never has and never will run a budget deficit. But, uh, but obviously we have to recognize the fiscal issues that people face. That's why I'm not expecting a big check right away. But we have to set in place the structures that we need in order to solve these problems long term. Simple as that. And when you see me go, or Gregor Robinson go, or Jim Watson go to Ottawa with our hat in our hands, I always remind people that we're not asking for a handout. We're asking for a small tax rebate. Because at the end of the day, it was taxpayers in the cities who gave those other orders of government the operating funds that we're asking for a little bit back on. You know, one of the things that when we have a conversation like this, and it's a public conversation, you always talk about us engaging the public on important issues. So right now, the city of um, Calgary has, um, through your leadership, opened the debate on what to do with $52 million in tax revenue that was vacated by the provincial government. And so now you're engaging council, you're engaging the public in the discussion of what to do with the money. So I guess my question to you is, you're opening the dialogue, you're opening the debate, why do you think that kind of process is going to result in a better decision about how to use them? I hope it results in a better decision. Um, I know it will result in a decision that is more supported by the citizens, and that's an important thing, I think. Um, because it would have been very, very easy for us to do one of two things. It's an election year, after all. So it would have been very, very easy for us to say, oh, let's just not take, jump into that tax room. Um, reduce everyone's taxes in the election year. Simple, 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 everyone would have been happy. If we had decided to take that money and put it all into transit, for example, we would have had one or two angry editorials and everyone would have forgotten about it uh, long before the election. Because you know what, we've done it before. Two years ago it was $42 million and we put it all into libraries, rec centers, and fireballs. And people loved it. People were super happy. But we decided to try something new and have a bit of a discussion with the public about what we should do. And it freaked out some people, it freaked out some of my council colleagues, and it certainly freaked out a bunch of people in the media. There has been a series of hysterical columns and editorials written. And I say hysterical in both senses of the word. There's a lot of hand wringing, um, but they're also funny because all of them boil down to how dare you actually ask people what they want because their opinion might be different than mine. Um, I think that's okay. Uh, I had a pollster who called me shockingly naive for a politician in actually going out and talking to people about decisions that affect their life. Well, if that's naive, I'll take it. Um, I think that's important. And I think the important thing to remember is that all of these are really good choices. And sometimes we get so, so what are they? There are five. A uh, dedicated capital fund for Calgary Transit. Not enough to build LRT, but it'll build it a, a part of our route ahead plan, which is a system of dedicated busways across the city. So, transit. A program of revitalizing older neighborhoods. So we would go in neighborhood by neighborhood and fix sidewalks, curbs, gutters, street lights, uh, sewage pipes, and upgrade parks and recreation facilities in each neighborhood, so geographically based. Three, reducing business taxes. Um, well, our residential property taxes are the lowest of any major city in Canada, about half of what they are in Toronto, by the way. Um, we don't enjoy the same um, advantage on our business property tax, which is about the middle of the pack. Four, paying down the city's debt. Well, we don't run an operating deficit, we do incur debt for capital projects, and our debt currently sits about $3.4 billion. Uh, and putting that $52 million a year towards debt would save us interest costs of about $1.5 million a year. And five, reducing residential property taxes, given that. Um, and those are all good options. They would all result in an improvement in people's quality of life. And that's the thing. I wanted to be a little lighthearted about this, to model to the people of Calgary that we can have serious discussions about serious things without killing one another, without acting as though the world will end if someone else's option wins. So, you know, we had a, a series of YouTube videos where my council members pitch options. We had a Dragon's Den style debate with Brett Wilson where he tried to really push on all of the ideas. Um, you know, 300 people showed up for that during the lunch hour. 
I don't get 300 people showing up at city council for debates. So people are engaged. And I tell you, as passionate as people are about whichever option they like, the number one thing we've heard is, thanks for asking. Right. And to me, that's a big deal. So the principle of getting people involved isn't all about getting the best answer. It's the engagement process itself, which is an important part of, I guess, your, your understanding of civic democracy. I hope that people hired, uh, hired me, elected me, um, because they believe that I have some judgment on issues. And I'm not abdicating my responsibility to make decisions. But I also believe very strongly that you make the best decisions when you have the best data. And for me, an incredibly important part of the data is expert <laughs> input and understanding what the experts think. But you know who the experts are, right? I, I love transit. I'm a transit nut. I take buses and trains all over the world. Whenever I'm traveling, I figure out how to take public transit from the airport and stuff like that. And, in, in, and I have colleagues who work at Calgary Transit who know everything about networks or fare optimization. I have colleagues who know how to drive trains and buses. And none of us are the experts. The experts is, of course, the person who takes the bus every day. Because she can tell you when the system's working and when it isn't, and what improvements are needed to the system. So in my world, expert input means making sure that you talk to the real experts. Everyone's an expert in their own life, which are the citizens. Get all that information and then make a decision. And at the end of the day, we are the most accountable form of government. Every single person in the city who gets to vote gets a ballot with my name on it. I don't hide behind a ward or a district. I don't hide behind a political party. They get to determine whether they like me or not. Um, and so I think I owe it to them to make sure that I am listening and as much as I possibly can before I make a decision, but ultimately I bear the responsibility for that decision. I'm just going to ask you a couple more questions. I think that we want to go to the audience and give people a chance to talk. I think you got through one of your seven. Um, <laughs> I got through more than you thought. <laughs> um, um, the question I really wanted to ask you is about collaboration. I think one of the things that we understand uh, being an innovation center is that it takes a whole lot of players um, working in concert in order to be able to produce the innovation result. Um, let's talk about strong cities. Uh, and if we're looking at the result of innovation being a stronger, more diversified economy, we're talking about stronger cities being a stronger, more diversified Canada. So I guess my question to you would be, how does building a strong Calgary, or any city for that matter, translate into Canada building? Canada is one of the most urban nations in the world, um, despite the popular perception of us as a wilderness country. Uh, over 80% of us live in cities. And I've been, I've been having fun on this trip um, with a little trivia question. Imagine Alberta, endless fields of wheat, cows, horses, ranches, you have seen it all, mountains. What percentage of Alberta's GDP comes from agriculture? Just yell at a number, what do you think? 22. 22. 15. 15. 3. 3. 7. 7. <laughs> 1.4. <laughs> okay, 1.4. Um, Saskatchewan's probably a little more than that, but not much more. Well, Saskatchewan's probably a bit more because potash you might put into agriculture, which is a big industry for them. But in any case, um, we are an urban country, and our prosperity depends on cities. And so, we live in a world where, as we all know, it's so cliche to say it, but it's true. Capital and labor are borderless and very, very, very mobile. So what we need in Canada is we need to be able to attract the very best and the very smartest graduating engineers or graduating artists from Shanghai or Mumbai or Dubai, anywhere else that ends in I. They need to be able to... Or um, we, want them to, we want them to stay. We want them to stay. But, um, So, we need them to go look. I could not only have a great life in Canada, I could also be at the top of my career in Canada. And we know that that young global talent doesn't choose countries, it chooses cities. I'm not moving to the UK so that I can live in Kent. Right? I want to be in London. 
I'm not moving to the U.S. so that I can live in Wichita, right? I'm thinking about New York or Chicago or Los Angeles or Houston. So we need to make sure that on the minds of those people in all those I places, they're thinking, I can be at the top of my profession in Vancouver or Calgary or Winnipeg or Toronto or God help us Edmonton. Um, there must be some profession you can be at the top of it. Firefighter, I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> so, uh, I'm shocked. My, my colleagues at Calgary are cringing. But, uh, <laughs> I thought you were working on a city charter with it. We love them, but we still see this. Okay. Um, <laughs> All family fun. Mayor Mandel is, in fact, one of the most outstanding political leaders in Canada today, and I'm sad that he's retiring. But, uh, he'll be replaced by an even stronger and greater mayor there, I hope. Anyway, um, but uh, we need those people to have us on their radar. And so we need a really strong Toronto, we need a really strong Calgary, a really strong Vancouver in order to be able to compete. If we can't get that global talent into Canada, we're done for. Um, and we figured that out as a nation. You know, our conservative government, conservative redneck government from Calgary, right, has increased immigration to unheard of levels. You know, record high levels. Jason Kenney is an incredibly smart guy. And I don't say that only because he's my political minister and I need stuff from him. Um, <laughs> whether or not you agree with the ideology, at the end of the day, they understand the need for Canada to be a real player in the global talent marketplace. The single biggest thing that Canada has going for it right now is that The Economist last year published a list of the top cities in the world in which to live and invest. Three of the five top cities were Canadian cities. Calgary, Vancouver, and I can't remember, one other one. Place where they're building transit, I think. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, and by the way, if we were five, you were four, we'll be, we'll be each of us here. But, but that's a huge deal. That's a huge deal because it means we're doing something right. And we are on those lists because people want to live and invest here and that's incredibly important for us to continue to do. You know, um, later on this year, in October, uh, there's, a, I think, a first for Calgary. The, the World Forum, Social Enterprise World Forum, is taking place. Just, just before the municipal election. They told me I could come speak there. Anyway. <laughs> there's a number of people in this room and in the city general who are working very really closely with Calgarians to kind of put social innovation on the map. One might cite this as an example of how people in Calgary and people in Toronto can work together, particularly in the area of the nation. I'm wondering if you can think of other ways in which these two great cities can jointly focus on innovation and work together. I mean, I love um, that we're doing that work together on social innovation. You know, before I was mayor, I was a professor of nonprofit management and social enterprise. And social innovation is a huge deal for me, which is why I really want to come speak at that forum. Mm. Even though it's just before the election, we'll figure out a way to make it happen. Um, because I think that's really important, because that's at the forefront of using creativity and knowledge to solve social issues that really impact on people's quality of life. So let me say I'm thrilled to hear that you're doing that. But there's lots of other ways we can do it, and this happens every day within the private sector, it happens every day in the nonprofit sector. Last night, uh, as I got off the plane, I had the opportunity to stop by this fabulous night market run by um, Stop Community Food Center. And unfortunately, I didn't get to eat anything because I just ended up talking the whole time, go figure. Um, but what we were talking about was how to export this concept of community food centers into similar neighborhoods to West End Toronto where, where Stop works uh, across the country. And uh, these are the sorts of things we need to always talk about. Uh, and think about how we transfer that. It happens in the private sector every single day, every single day. Um, you know, certainly uh, there are incredible technology transfer, startup assistance, and so on that happens throughout. Our role, I think, as government is to find models that work. You know, um, Innovate Calgary, our version of Mars isn't perfect, but they're doing some interesting, cool things. Mars is probably not perfect either, um, but is doing cool, innovative things. And I think learning from one another uh, about this stuff is how we grow and that's the nice thing about being the Canadian family we are not at this point in our history competing with one another we're helping one another grow a strong Calgary needs a strong Toronto and I think vice versa uh, and I think the policymakers have by and large figured that out and the private sector has certainly figured that out 
nonprofit sector is lagging a little bit, but they'll get there. Um, and, I, and, I, and I think we just seize that opportunity. This has been a really terrific conversation on so many levels. I really appreciate your candor and um, your optimism, because I see that underlying so much of what it is that you do. You know, last summer there was a poll done by Andrew Street um, of people living in major cities in Canada asking them about the quality of life. And it was no surprise, of course, that Calgary came in first on 10 out of 12 measures. We tied on the 11th, we didn't do that well on the 12th, so we got a little bit of work to do. But one of the questions was, is yours a city on the rise? And an astonishing 90% of Calgarians agreed with that statement. So the optimism isn't mine. It's the optimism of the people in Calgary that you see that you see our, our logo up there, you be part of the energy. It's not just about the carbon atoms, it's about the energy of people in the city and the attitude that anything is possible here. That anything is possible because if you want to work hard and you've got good ideas, we'll take you. It's an immigrant society, it's a place, as I always say, where nobody cares where you went to school or who your daddy is or what your last name is. They only care about what you bring to the table. And that's where that optimism comes from. But I think that's a Canadian optimism. I think it's an optimism that we share across this country at this moment in our history. Uh, and it's up to us as policymakers to capitalize on that. And that, for me, is a very exciting opportunity. Thank you. Let's take some questions from uh, the audience. Could you, there's a microphone there, please. Can you use that to, so that everyone can hear you? And we're also being uh, recorded. So uh, we'd love to be able to get your question. Could you just say what your name is, sir, and give us a question? Uh, my name is Henry Chen, and uh, uh, I have some question for uh, Mr. Nashi. And we are here at the Mars. This is a place of uh, intellectual property. And but I haven't heard anything uh, about intellectual property uh, since you are here. And according according to my study, I am tracking the uh, pattern landscape of the whole Canada, and I found that. Uh, Calgary is uh, uh, is a major pattern hub, U.S. pattern hub in the western uh, province, uh, but it's not very hot. And uh, uh, according to your uh, perception or and your planning, how are you going to use uh, uh, your influence to nurture intellectual property? Uh, in Calgary and make it as a major economic uh, growth uh, steam, uh, growth factors. Thank you. Terrific question. Thank you. Um, one of the really interesting things about Calgary that may surprise people is that we have uh, not only one of the youngest, but by far the highest educated workforce um, in the country. And there is an enormous amount of innovation happening, particularly in STEM, and science, technology, and engineering. Um, but the problem we have is that much of that innovation is happening in silos. It's happening within companies um, and is being held proprietary. People don't even want to file for patents because they don't want people to know what they've got. And which sounds, sounds weird, right? Uh, and one of our challenges is that we have not yet gotten to the point where a place like KW, Kitchener Waterloo, has gotten to where those companies act as the nucleus of an ecosystem of innovation around them. So, you know, for example, we have a hugely successful tech company called Smart Technologies. You probably all use smart boards in your lives, okay. right? But Smart has not yet operated in a way that RIM, for example, would have operated in Waterloo to really start up a huge ecosystem of spin-offs and so on. And that's one of the things we're really working on. Um, our version of Mars uh, is an organization called Innovate Calgary. And Innovate Calgary is really working hard to make sure that we create a community around those startups and around that IP and how we manage all of that. And we're not there yet. So although we have 5,300 tech startups in Calgary, they're not coalescing into a community the way I would like. But we're starting to see some real change in that, um, both at the very grassroots level with people who you know, run these sorts of um, you know, the camps, the unconferences where they just come together and solve coding problems and stuff in a bar, um, bar camps they call them, 
or hackathons. We have hackathons, exactly. We're starting to get that at the very grassroots level. We're starting to get a real network of venture capitalists, and particularly mezzanine finance people, at a, at a higher level, and these connections are starting to happen. But it's interesting because we're in 2013, and we're having conversations that I remember people in Waterloo were having in 2003. So we got a little bit of catch up to play on that. Uh, we certainly have the innovation, we've got the entrepreneurs in a very entrepreneurial environment, and we have to make sure that we have the ecosystem that allows that to work better. Other questions? Yes, your name please. Uh, my name is Jared. Uh, thanks for coming, Nairnaji. Uh, I had a question, because you, you mentioned that 90% of Calvarians think that their city's on the rise, which is flabbergasting to us living in Toronto, and it's not just because of the whole Game 7 thing, Still recovering from that. Um, but if you had uh, three things that I have you so many things I could say about that, <laughs> none of which I will. Um, you still got a piece of us in your heart, you know. You know. I was born here. Yeah. So anyway, if you could bring three things that you've done unsuccessfully in terms of innovation in Calgary and kind of bring those best practices to Toronto, what would those three things be? I love that you asked me for three things. I was a management consultant for so long, and I knew to only talk in threes. Um, and you'll notice that uh, I'm wearing a number three. So that's the first thing I'll tell you about, is the number three that I'm wearing. The number three that I'm wearing is, stands for three things for Calgary. And I want everyone to steal three things for Calgary for their own community. It's completely open source. It's a very simple program that's designed to encourage citizenship and engagement. And all it means is I reach out to every citizen and say, this year, do three things for your community. And this is an incredible way to nurture optimism and innovation because it's, to, it's so easy, right? It's so simple. It's just one sentence and a website where people share their stories. And tens of thousands of people have signed up to do their own three things for the community. Um, but the reason it's so powerful well, I'll tell you the story behind it. When I was first elected, I asked a group of super volunteers to go out and figure out how to engage more people in the community. We had record high voter turnout in the election when I was elected, and I wanted to maintain that level of civic engagement. By the way, the only city to beat the record high voter engagement that we had, Toronto. As you may recall, in your 2010 election, you also had record high voter turnout, a half a point higher than we had. Um, and so the question was, how do we maintain that level of engagement? So they came back with this program, Three Things for Calgary, and I hated it. I said, it's, you've done something miraculous. You've created something that's too simple and too complicated at the same time. And it's too simple because you're not telling people what to do. You're not giving them access to resources to show ways in which they can make a difference in their community. And we know from the research that the number one reason people don't volunteer in their communities is no one asks them to. So you're not gonna do anything just by saying three things to the community. You have to have volunteer fairs and show people different opportunities to get involved and so on. And it's too complicated because you're asking them to do three things instead of one thing. And no one's gonna sign up for that. You have to have a lower barrier to entry. It turns out I could not have been more wrong than both counts. The power of the program is exactly those two things. Because we're not telling people what to do, because we're relying on the endless ingenuity and resilience of the human being, they figure it out themselves. So people are starting to figure out that it's not about the mayor or city council or business or organizations like Mars to change the community. It's about every single one of us to be able to change the community, take into our own hands and hearts and minds and souls the ability to make life better in our neighborhoods and for our neighbors. That's a huge deal. It's a huge mental leap for people to realize they have power. Um, and I think that, that makes a big difference. And the three, of course, is a bit of a ruse. It's not really about doing three things. It's about creating a habit, a lifetime habit of service. Um, and people get that. And I always talk about the top secret fourth thing. And the top secret fourth thing that I encourage people to do is not to be shy, to actually share their service and to talk loudly and widely and proudly about the difference they're making in other people's lives and more important, about the joy that their service brings them. Um, and creating that ethic of change. And that's where that optimism comes from. It's not because, oh my gosh, I love my mayor and he's so good looking and <laughs> he makes me feel good when I look at him because he's just 
so darn handsome. Um, <laughs> you knew I'd get it in. I'm looking at my colleagues. Um, I was just voted the sexiest man in Calgary third year running. <laughs> I mentioned that. And, uh, Who else was in the competition? He's been number two three years running, and he's, uh, he's out of my way. I'm slowly eliminating the competition. <laughs> Brent Wilson, aforementioned Dragon's Den guy, went from third to second. He's very proud of himself. Um, okay. Still has very bad shirts. Horrific. <laughs> <laughs> oh! oh. Um, anyway, um, yes, everyone who's ever met me ever predicted that I would be sexiest man in Calgary. Um, <laughs> I probably shouldn't tell you that since I'm trying to recruit people to come to Calgary. <laughs> if you are an eye doctor, there is something really a shortage. <laughs> anyway, um, and it's not about that, right? It's not about that. It's about the fact that people realize that not only is the community on the rise, but that they're part of that. Uh, and I think that that makes a huge difference because the city outlives its politicians, the city outlives uh, whatever the economy is doing at any time. It's a resilient place, and so that's kind of number one. Um, I, I'm not even going to go into two more because there's probably other questions. I'm but, but there's one that I for. But anyways, thanks for your question. Appreciate it. Thanks. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Chelsea Ma, and thank you, Mayor Nenshi, for sharing your thoughts with us this morning. Um, I wanted to bring, go back to your thoughts earlier about monetizing our natural resources today to pay for public transit and other infrastructure tomorrow. And how, how do you balance those future long-term needs with future environmental needs and the risk that climate scientists are warning us about today? Look, that's a really important question. And it, you have to answer it in terms of a little bit of real politics. And sometimes people will get nervous when I start talking like that, right? When you think about the impacts of our current energy production on air, land, and water, there aren't really very many impacts. I'm talking specifically about the Alberta oil sense here. There really aren't very many impacts on land. Um, of course, you see pictures of the old school strip mines, and you go, wow, that's really ugly. And the strip mines are really ugly, but the land can be reclaimed. The jury is still out on water, um, but the best science we've got shows that, again, the water impacts are relatively inert. This is going to sound really unfeeling, but the tailings ponds don't go anywhere. And in fact, the new technology doesn't create tailings ponds. But the older tailings ponds don't go anywhere. They don't appear to be leaching into the regular environment. You've got to keep ducks out of them. Um, but you have an opportunity, you have the ability and the benefit of time to be able to reclaim that land. The big problem, of course, is air. And while um, the oil sands are actually not the largest generator of GHGs in Canada. By a long shot, as you know, coal-fired power plants are a much, much bigger generator um, than the oil sands are. Um, they're a big one. And while they're a tiny proportion, an infinitesimally small proportion of world GHG emissions, we've got to be serious about that. And that's a decision we've got to make. And while the processes are becoming much more efficient, well, there's certainly, uh, you know, well, the energy emissions intensity, the, the emissions intensity um, of the oil sense has gone like this over the years. It's still pretty high. And that's a decision that we just have to make. And we have to say, are we willing to live with that environmental impact? Because that one cannot be mitigated at source. I don't really believe in carbon capture and storage, and if it's going to work, which seems to be the only opportunity to do that. And when we look at the wellhead to tailpipe emissions, in fact, you know, as you have all heard, they're not they're not that bad. As long if people are burning carbon to get carbon through a pipeline from northern Alberta to the Gulf Coast is actually about as carbon intensive as to dig it up in Saudi Arabia and ship it by tanker, or Venezuela and ship it by tanker to the Gulf Coast. If we could create a low carbon environment tomorrow where the demand wasn't there, this would be a very different policy discussion. But given that the demand is there, this is a policy discussion that we have to have, and we have to say, look, when you, have, when you say that word sustainability, right, we, we're talking about environmental sustainability, of course, but we're also talking about social and financial sustainability for our nation in the long term. And I think that we're mature enough as a community to be able to have that conversation. And the thing that bothers me about this, I'm not going to talk about Northern Gateway because I think there's actually a pretty legit discussion to be had there. The thing that bothers me about the Keystone XL discussion is that we've got this one meter wide pipe. It's a one meter wide pipe. 
36 inches. And somehow we're making that pipe carry all the sins of the carbon economy. I don't think that's fair. Um, and I think that that gets us to a discussion that goes beyond the conversation we need to have as a community. You know, I've had lots of people say to me, the fight against Keystone is not a fight to prevent the pipeline from being built. They believe that if the pipeline is not built, oil sands production and exploration will shut down. That's dumb. It's dumb because it's wrong for the country, but it's also dumb because it's not going to happen. Governments across this country are losing $3 billion a month because of the price differential between Alberta crude and West Texas and Canadian. $3 billion a month. If that pipeline gets built, and if it doesn't get built, rail will replace it, which is much more environmentally damaging than a pipeline. Um, and that differential goes away. We lose most provincial and federal budget deficits in this country on that one meter wide pipe. So clearly the public policy a better way to do things like producing water used in, in the production of oil in all sense. Got time for one more question. Um, I'm afraid so this gentleman can come here. Uh, my name is Vladimir Cohen. I'm a big believer in and investor in Calgary. I would encourage people not only to move to Calgary, but to buy houses from us. We build about 350 a year. A company is called Genesis, but it's a terrific and, city. And maybe some new technology for me sometime soon. So <laughs> anyway. I, I have a, a very broad question. We've talked about different forms of collaboration. What is your view on the role and importance of public-private partnerships in renewing the infrastructure in Calgary and elsewhere? I'm very, very agnostic on who builds and who operates stuff. Um, I'm interested in getting the best possible deal for the taxpayer, uh, and I strip ideology out of that. Now, the really interesting thing about most P3s, most public-private partnerships, is if you believe in uh, efficient markets, and I do, I'm going to talk like a finance geek for just a second, the net present value is always zero, because whatever benefit of uh, the benefit from financing the private sector can offer is offset by the lower cost of borrowing for the municipal government. That, that's just efficient markets at work. So if the net present value is always zero straight up on cash flows, you have to believe two things to make P3s work. One is that the private sector is just fundamentally and intrinsically more efficient at operating um, infrastructure than the public sector is, and that, that can be true. Uh, and the second is that the private sector is much better able to manage risk, um, both construction risk, budget risk, and operating risk. And that also can be true. And so what I really believe in is you just look at things as dispassionately as you can, strip the ideology out, and try and figure out how the numbers are going to work. So, for example, we're building a giant new composting facility. We're finally going to be doing curbside uh, compost collection from people's houses only, oh, I don't know, 20 years after Toronto did it. We wanted to make sure it worked. Um, and that is being built through a DBOP3. That fund for abbreviations. So we found that our cost of borrowing was better than any of our private sector partners. So it's not DBFO, it's not being financed by the private sector, but it's being designed, built, and operated by the private sector uh, on a long term 25 year contract. And we figured that that made more sense because it, although it, we take on the capital cost and the debt up front, it reduces our operating risk significantly over time. And we think the cost of collections over time. So we're very, very keen on that. Um, and, we're, and we look at everything about $100 million, we look at a model, a filter to determine whether a P3 makes sense and whether it should be designed, build, operate, design, build, own, operate, or design, build, finance, and operate. Um, so I'm, I'm very pleased to look at all of those things. Um, and, you know, you know, for example, a case that you might be familiar with, I don't know why I think you might be familiar with, but we've got some really interesting intellectual property um, at the City of Calgary. and. We're looking at a hybrid model where we will market that property within the province of Alberta. We're looking for a private partner to be able to take on that IP and market it uh, outside of the province of Alberta. I feel like you might know about that. Um, and uh, and I think those are all ways in which to create these kinds of partnerships, and I think they make a lot of sense. Now, the last thing I'll say about that is in, in your other business in line development, um, certainly we think about P3s in a new way, um, and a lot of that has to do with how we upfront the cost of infrastructure. City can't always afford to build the infrastructure and put it in place for the development to occur. So we haven't yet figured out the model that makes sense for the developer to upfront the cost and be paid back over time. Um, 
uh, on, uh, and, but we'll get there. We'll get there. And, and I think we're doing a lot of really innovative things in that industry as well to get our heads around how we build fire halls and libraries and things in the neighborhoods. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Nenshi, I'm, I'm afraid our conversation um, has to close. I think that everyone would agree that you have elevated the level of discussion about civic issues to um, a point where all of us are not only engaged, but thinking more about our own city. And that's all we could ask for you. You've done your job. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thank you very much. Thank you all.